Father, we want to thank you for the chance to open up the word. You are the living word. And we have an opportunity to see your example by what you have given us in the written word. And I hope that the words jump off the page and we go to a deeper level and we come to know you personally because that's the really the only way to really be known by you. And that's from the heart. And so, Jesus, thank you for teaching us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we get ready to um, go into the study for this afternoon, I want us to, if we could, take our Bibles and turn to the book of First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter five is where we're going to begin today. Our anchor text in First Thessalonians chapter five. Again, this is an epistle. This is a letter. And we're jumping in near the end of this letter. And I say that so that we can have context, understanding that this is kind of a concluding thought, meaning that there are many other thoughts before that led up to this point. So with that in mind, the assumption is that you're already on this track. And I believe if you're watching this more than likely and the Lord has led you here, you're either wanting to go a, a certain direction or you are you are in a direction. But this is to encourage us to keep moving forward. Even we may find ourselves slipping back or even wanting to turn back. That's why I believe this is going to be a good word for us today, because when we read in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse number 23, look at the promise that we have here in the Bible. It says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many PowerPoints in this one slide. But when you think about what we mean by the idea or the word sanctify, and what we mean um, by the idea of wholeness, we wanna use words in the verse to explain itself. In other words, let the Bible explain itself and we don't have to bring our own interpretation to it. When you look here at 1 Thessalonians chapter five, to define the idea or the word to sanctify, it's really beautiful to recognize that he says, sanctify you wholly for the purpose of what? To be preserved. So when we're thinking of sanctification, let's think of a preservation. So the assumption is that whatever is being preserved is where it needs to be. You know, when you think about something that you buy, a packaged food, that food is packaged because it has been prepared. It is not a matter of it being prepared. It's complete. It's done. The sealing process or the sanctification process is to preserve the newness, is to preserve the cleanliness, is to preserve the rightness of that particular item. This is the prayer that Paul has for the saints in Thessalonica, that they would be preserved, that they would be sanctified. But then he says, to what degree? To what end? Is this a situation of like when we get groceries, we put groceries in a grocery bag, but most of us don't seal up that bag. But then we have items in the grocery bag or cart or, or, or whatever, and they're completely sealed because we want them to be completely whole. So the degree to which he wants us to be sanctified, the Bible is telling us holy or completely because we can infer when he says that the spirit praying that you will be sanctified or preserved blameless. Blameless means without blame, without um, liability, without a hole in terms of our spiritual stand in Christ. And when we are in Christ, we are wholly his. And sanctification is the process of us being completely settled in that state, completely firm in Christ. So let's get these words of definition in play so that when we're speaking them, when we're reading them, we're all on the same page, literally. <laughs> so now to be sanctified is to be preserved. And the degree to which the Lord wants to sanctify you and me is completely. And so he uses that word there, whole or holy, in reference to the, the measure of this gift. So when I was thinking about the idea of wholeness, a lot of times um, we think of a whole piece of clothing or a whole piece of food. But I wanted to use something that was a little more relevant to what we were just talking about in terms of change health. And when we talk about whole grains, whole grains, 
What is it that makes a whole grain a whole grain? And what is it that makes something a half grain or a broken grain? So I went to the pantry and we just so happened to have uh, actual grain. And when I say we actually have some grain, this is, these are wheat berries. These are actually some red spring wheat berries that are um, hard red berries that we use to make or to grow um, when we're making wheat grass. Because all wheat grass is, is taking this seed, letting it sprout into a grass, and then taking that grass and juicing it before it grows into that long stem of grain, right? That's normally what we see or think when we're talking about a grain. But I actually have here some examples of these wheat berries. Now, the thing about a wheat berry or any grain seed, whether it's an oat or whether it's barley or even rice, is that there are certain components that it possesses that makes it a whole grain. And so what I wanna do now is let's zoom in and try to understand some of these layers in the seed, because I believe it will help us understand, again, how he wants to preserve us, how he wants to sanctify us. So I know this is kind of hard to see it in my hand, so why not go to someone else's hand to look at how the wheat berries would look? This is how they would look up close. These are actually whole seeds or the whole grain of an oat. So you've got oats, you've got wheats, different kinds. But here is something that they have in common. And there are components or pieces that our creator put on them so that not only that they will be whole, but even so that they would be preserved. When you look at a whole grain, like an oat up close, there are three basic pieces or components to a grain seed. You'll see three layers, one on the outside, one on the inside, and then one at the very center near the bottom, there are three parts to a whole grain. The one that we normally see or that we normally consume is that endosperm. Now around that endosperm is the actual bran. That's the skin, that's the fiber that holds the endosperm or the meat of the seed inside. But even inside of that meat, at the very heart, of that seed is the germ. And the germ is at the very center, whether it's mid center or low center, but it's always in the endosperm layer. So going from one, two, three, you've got the germ in the middle, surrounded by the endosperm, and then encapsulated with the bran. When you look at how a seed would look and, 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 and the different uh, ratios or how much of what is in a seed, you'll see that most of a seed is carbohydrate. And a carbohydrate is the energy source. That's the fuel source. That's what our body needs in order to be fueled. But the creator did not just give the fuel aspect or the carbohydrate piece of the seed, but he also created the fiber. That's the skin. And so while most of it is endosperm, that skin is vital to protect and preserve the carbohydrate or the endosperm, but it also has a function when we eat it. Its job is to slow down the degrading or the breaking down of that carbohydrate or that energy, if you will, the sugar that that seed possesses. So it's like a time release, a pouring out of the energy and not just the dumping. Now, this is how a whole grain looks. But the reality is, is that most grains today do not look like this. In fact, when you look at the color of these brands, they're always a certain hue, a certain tone, because half grains look differently than whole grains. Because by definition, a half grain or a partial or processed or enriched grain has had the skin removed the fiber taken away, and what you're left with is the carb or the endosperm. Looking at it again in this way, notice the comparison between the whole grain and the refined grain. You see how the refined grain and whole grain both possess the endosperm or that carbohydrate, but there are two essential things missing from that processed grain, and that is the germ, and that is the fiber. 
And they're important. They're important because as you can see, the brand is the layer that has vitamins and minerals of its own, and it helps us digest that seed that we may be eating. And then you also see that the germ has a powerful point because that is where even more vitamin and more mineral content is to give our bodies not just energy, but nutrition, the nutrients that we need to live. So now, when we think about this in terms of sanctification, what we have to ask ourselves and what the word is challenging us to consider today is are we giving it all to Jesus? In essence, then, are we letting him sanctify or purify us wholly or partially? Like remember the sister in the skit, she was giving Jesus a lot but she wasn't giving Jesus all. And that is a, like a situation of a refined grain that has a measure of health, but it does not have all the power that it could have because it's not a whole grain. A whole grain gives us everything that we need. And so when First Thessalonians says that he wants to sanctify us wholly, it's in effect saying, I want you to have a whole grain experience and not to settle for a processed partial experience that is not complete. It's a work, but it's incomplete. And other places in scripture liken this partial experience to the idea of living in the flesh and in the spirit. Rather than answering Jesus's call, which was to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. See here in Galatians chapter five, verse 13, this biblical understanding of processed grain or partial sanctification Brethren, you've been called unto liberty, liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love do what? Serve one another. God's desire is that we would not have a hobble horse Christianity, but that we would have a wholehearted experience. What do I mean when I say hobble horse? Worshiping on Sabbath, but then living out on Sunday through Friday. What's a partial experience? Being nice in front of people, but being ugly behind doors. What's an enriched grain in a spiritual sense? The idea of doing one thing with our hand, but having a whole nother party, a whole nother drama, a whole nother situation going on in our head. This is not what the Lord has ordained for us. Because when you look at this kind of situation, through the eyes of, of inspiration, look at how it's described. It's described here in the book Sanctified Life on page number nine, that many who profess sanctification are entirely ignorant of the work of grace upon the heart. When proved and tested, they're found to be like the self-righteous Pharisee. They will bear no contradiction. In other words, they won't bear or abide anybody or anything that goes against what they want to do. They lay aside reason and judgment and depend wholly upon their feelings, basing their claims to sanctification upon emotions, which they have at some time experienced. This is another lens by which to understand so that we can reflect and say, am I whole brain or am I half brain? Am I whole heart or half heart? A lot of stuff I've given away, but not all have I given away. What he offers us is a whole grain experience so that we can be Christians every day of the week. We can be Christians in good times and bad times. We can be strong against temptation when we are around others or when we are all alone. There's this power that comes from whole grain Christianity. And that's what we're going to term it as whole sanctification. No longer living in the flesh and the spirit, but by the grace of God, living by his spirit wholeheartedly. Here's what the Bible says and how we can experience it in Romans chapter 12. We are told, we are even not commanded, but we are exhorted. Be not conformed to this world. Yes, that's a commandment. I was, I, I was trying to give it gospel light, but we got to give it gospel straight. It's a commandment. Don't be conformed to this world, but instead be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and 
perfect will of God. I hope that this study is helping us to get a new acquaintance with the concept and the word perfect. We think of perfect in a moral sense. Well, it does have a moral application. The idea of perfect is not just a moral reality, but it speaks to the degree to which we are in Christ. Perfect in that we are complete. Perfect in that we are whole. When you go back to creation and look at Genesis chapter one and where it says at the end of every day, what does God say? He says it is good. He said what he made was perfect. In other words, not just that there was no flaw, but that there was nothing else to be added to the land once the land had been added. I'm talking about as far as the land is concerned. Yes, eventually he put things on the land. But when he made the sun, he said this sun is the best it is the complete, it is the wholeness of my desire and my design when I said, let there be a son. There's no other son that can compete with this son. And there's nothing else that I have to do to the son in order for it to be the son. It is what it is. And it is perfect. It is complete. So here in Romans chapter 12, the invitation for transformation is so that we will have nothing lacking, nothing missed. The alternative to conformity is transformation. Transformation is what sanctification is when we accept it. You know, true sanctification, it says here, true sanctification. Again, it speaks to the degree to which it takes place. It's an entire conformity to the will of God. See, Romans 12 is calling us out of being conformed to this world. If you will, it's calling us away from being conformed to what we want to do. It's not that we don't have a desire, but our desire is not king. Our desire is not God, if you will. Our desire now becomes to do the desire of our creator and of our redeemer. True sanctification and entire conformity to the will of God. Meaning what? Rebellious thoughts and feelings are overcome. And the voice of Jesus awakens a new life. That's key. The voice of Jesus. And it pervades the entire being. Those who are truly sanctified will not set up their own opinion as a standard of right and wrong. They are not bigoted or self-righteous. But they are jealous of self, even fearing lest a promise being left them, they should come short of complying with the conditions upon which the promises are based. True sanctification is everything. And now for reflection, I ask you, and you gotta be honest with you, are you giving it all? Not are you giving it or your all. I'm not talking about effort here because when it, we make salvation and when we make sanctification and the basis of it, our effort, then you're going to devolve to an evolutionary standpoint. It now becomes the survival of the fittest in that I had a stronger will than you. Therefore, I stopped doing this. I stopped doing that. So now if that was the case and if that was how it operated, I could knock on heaven's doors, go to Jesus and say, Jesus, you got to let me in. He looks at me and he says, why? And I say, well, I didn't give it all up. Well, why not? He asked. And I ask or I say, well, I'm glad you asked because my will was not as strong as Tara's will, or my will or my fortitude wasn't as strong as my daughter's. And so now I've got a leg to stand on legally if that was the basis of our salvation. It's not our willpower that creates or that procures our salvation. It is our willpower to choose to accept the terms of sanctification, the terms of salvation. And the Bible has laid out these terms and it starts by saying, the way forward is through Jesus. In other words, you giving it all because Jesus will take it all. Jesus will deliver us from all. Yes, he will do it. So when we think about sanctification and the journey and the process, now we're going to look at scriptures that make it very clear. It is by his might. It is by his power. The only thing we can do is say yes. But let's look at what Jesus is willing to do for us because he even says it in the next verse. 
That's why what I'm talking about today is possible because verse 23 says the very God of peace sanctify you holy, semicolon, meaning there's more to read. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to be preserved blameless and all of us. How faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. There it is. That's the great news to the good news. And that is that everything the Lord is calling you to today, everything he's calling you to do right now, everything he has created you to be, he is able to do it. And that's why we're reminded of it there in verse number 24. But that's not the only place where the Bible says he will do this work. He says there in Leviticus, going back to Leviticus chapter 20, speaking of sanctification in these terms, he says, you shall be holy unto me. Holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. H-O-L-Y. You will be this, he says. And now I'm going to tell you how. For I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that you shall be mine. Who does the severing? He says, I have severed you from other people. Bible, Christian, true sanctification is God's severing, not ours. It is him separating, not us ourselves. He says, I will sever, meaning that's why every lie that the devil brings to us. Let me put it to you this way. I'm kind of going, jumping ahead of time. That's why every temptation in effect is a lie. Because everything that the Lord is calling the Christian to. Now, remember, this is 1 Thessalonians 5. The assumption is this is someone who's accepted Christ. And when you believe in Jesus, now you have the authority to say and the truth to say that whatever he brings to me, it really doesn't belong to me. Because Leviticus says that by me accepting Christ, I have been severed from all what the other people do. I have been severed from what the natural man used to do. And the point that we're really looking at in this verse is that he does the severing. He will do it. He says it this way in Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 28, he says, and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, where my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. He says it outright. I am the one that sanctifies Israel, meaning he is the one who will sanctify you. He is the one that is preserving you. Not only in Ezekiel chapter 37 in the Old Testament, but even here in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter two. This is all about the new covenant, right? Absolutely. The old covenant failed, not because Jehovah failed, but we failed. We decided that we were going to do what only he could do. And when doing that, we failed. But Hebrews now re revives the hope to say, look, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Who is the sanctified? Us, when we accept Jesus Christ. But who is the sanctifier? Who is the preserver? Who is the separator of sinner from sin? Jesus is. And he is our big brother. And because of it, we're one. Down here in Ephesians chapter five, in the echoes of the, of the command for husbands to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself forward, it goes right into explaining how that love is, 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 is reflected from how Jesus treats his bride, his wife, the church. He says here that Christ may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So just like as Christ loved the church, who is the one who cleans the church? Jesus, Jesus cleans the church. Who is the one that sanctifies it? Christ is the one that sanctifies it. It doesn't stop there. Verse 27 says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, having not spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So it's, it's literally saying, who's the one that washes the church? 
Jesus. And then who is the one that irons out the wrinkles on that clean garment? Beautiful relationship between justification and sanctification. That's why we got sometimes folks trying to get ironed who haven't been clean. But when you've been cleaned by the blood of the lamb, you have now entered into the laundry of love, the, the cleaners of grace. And now Jesus spends the rest of our lives ironing out that which he has cleansed. And so some of us can get discouraged and we doubt whether or not we've been clean because we've still got wrinkles to be worked on. And that is the case when we're outside of Christ. But if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've entered into his laundry to allow him now to iron out the wrinkles. And how do we iron out wrinkles? There's only one way. Heat. He uses the heat of this life. He uses the heat of the struggle. He uses the heat of living and doing the right thing in a wrong world to iron out now these wrinkles. So he's the severer. He's the cleaner. He's the ironer. What do we do? Well, if we were to go on the heels of the analogy of this unclean or rather this clean garment that what used to be unclean, all that the, 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 the garment has to do on the ironing board is be still. And the same thing for you and me today to experience this sanctification. If we believe it and if we know it now, be still. Let God work. And one way, you know, if you're letting him work is if you're asking him to work. One of the ways that we know that we can we can experience this is not just that Jesus wants to do it, it's that we allow him to do it and we believe he'll do it. See, when you go back to First Thessalonians, look at chapter four, it says in verse number three, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. I say this and we go to this verse so that we could understand that our desire to do right is actually God's desire being manifested in us. Philippians says, I believe in chapter two, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we're understanding that this is the will of God so that we can have no doubt when we're asking for it. We can have no doubt when we're trying to stand on it. We can look at the whole host of hell and say, you are defeated because God wants me to overcome today. God wills me to be holy, holy today. In fact, when Mark chapter 11 and verse number 24, Jesus says, we have to buck up. We have to stand firm. And remember, I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them which is also saying if you don't believe and rather, which is also saying that if you don't believe that you can receive it, it's impossible for you to achieve it. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe I will not in the name of Jesus. Da, 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 da. You have to believe in the name of Jesus by Jesus. I will da, 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 da. whatever it is you've been trying and trying and trying, but just been failing and failing and failing it. You got to believe it. It's not just me saying it. It's not just God saying it, but it's us seeing it in the eyes of faith. In fact, in the book, An Appeal to Youth, page 54, do not merely come to God and ask. But what? Believe he will do just as he has said he would. As you ask, believe he answers and believe you do receive strength from him. This is a powerful quote because it says, as you, as you ask, believe he answers. Not after he answers, believe that he answered. That's what well, people say. Well, why, why can't it be that way? Well, that other way doesn't require faith. And also when it's done, we will take the credit and the glory to ourselves. So what the master has done is design this construct that allows us to experience things before they happen so that we can grow in faith and trust of the one who makes it happen. When we go to a personal experience of why it's so important now to believe in the wholeness of holiness, to believe that what God wants to do, he wants to go all the way. No excuses, no limitations, no ceilings, I, I, I was reading this testimony 
And what happened was it's actually a part of it. This is a letter that the author is writing to her child and trying to encourage him in the idea of wholeness, W-H-O-L-E, the wholeness of being surrendered to Christ and not just the partial. So I go into this now so we could get some context to a mother writing to her children. Here in Appeal to Youth in page 54, it says, my dear boys, learn to trust in God. Learn to go to him who is mighty to save. He knows what you need before you ask him, but he has made this your duty and the duty of every one of us to come to him and ask him in confidence for what we need. That's all we gotta do. It is our responsibility to reach out. It's our call to come to him. And after we've come, it says we must comply with the conditions laid down in his word, namely ask, tell the dear savior just what you need. He that said, suffer little children to come into me and forbid them not will not reject your prayer, but he will send his angels to guard you and protect you from the evil angels and will make it easy for you to do right. What? Did you catch that? He will even make it easy to do what was impossible to do before we asked him. It'll be much easier than if you should try in your own strength. You may ever feel like this. I have asked God to help me and he will do it. I will do right in his strength. I will not grieve the dear angels that God has appointed to watch over me. I will never take a course to drive them from me. For if they should leave me, I should then have all the evil angels around me to control my actions and lead me to do wickedly and grieve my parents. But we do not believe that good angels will leave you because we believe you will do right and encourage their watchful care. The words of a mother to her children, a godly mother trying to raise godly children. These words are an echo of the words of our heavenly father to us, his holy children. And he's saying, if you will just call on me, I'll clean you up. You know, when I close, uh, in closing this, when I think about an analogy to really to, to bring this home, the spirit took me to the story of a vision. And this particular vision took place uh, in, in the setting of the sanctuary. And it's there in the book of the prophet Zechariah, a powerful book. We may not read it often. And I want to encourage you, if you've got some time left between now and sunset, perhaps you can just go through and read the whole book. But this chapter in Zechariah really illustrates the beauty of having a God who will do for us what we can't do for ourselves. A God who will sanctify us, who will preserve us holy. You know, there in the in the sanctuary and vision now in Zechariah, here we see Joshua being the high priest, not the priest ministering here uh, in this particular sanctuary. But again, Zechariah in vision is taken and he sees Joshua serving as high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan now standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord says to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, a brand is, is not just a stick or a staff, but a brand could also be referring to a seed or something on a stem. And on that stem, you could have that seed like we were mentioning earlier. And so when he's saying that this is a brand or this is a seed, this is a promise, this is a potential that was in the flame of sin, that was in the flame of the flesh. But now I have reached in and grabbed it out of the fire. That's what Jesus does when he saves us from our sin through justification. When we call on him and ask for forgiveness, it is as if he reaches into the fire of our sin and pulls us out. But see, Jesus is not just all about the pulling out. He is about the putting in of what he wants to see, and that's himself. And that's the process of sanctification. With this in mind, we see Joshua now. But Joshua, 
who has been pulled out of the fire, he's still clothed in verse three with what kind of garments? Filthy garments. But he's standing before the Lord. I know if you're like me, you're watching this and you're standing before the Lord and you're grateful for what we've been learning. But you know, and as I know, there are things that are on our garments. We've got stains on our garments. There's stuff that we are still finding ourselves falling into. Habits, thoughts, predilections, ideas, and ways, and attitudes, and mentalities, and reactions, and you know the rest that you know that ain't right, but it's me. Let's get here beside Joshua now because Joshua was not alone and neither are you. Because the Bible says that he was there and he answered now in verse number four and says, and spake unto those that stood before him, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him, he says, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. The change of raiment in exchange for these dirty priestly garments is now, he says, I will give you the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ. But you have to let me take the old and filthy garments. Joshua had to let go. You and I have to let go. This is that wholeness that we want to experience. And it's that process of letting go. When we let go, the Bible says, he says, let them set a fair mitre upon his head in verse five. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and they clothed him with garments and the angel of the Lord stood by. In this whole process, Joshua was never alone. In your process of wholeness, you're not alone. Jesus is your counselor. He is your keeper and he's your tailor because he is the one who gives to us the constant reflection and the constant revelation of who he is. So when you're in that tight spot, when you're at that point of temptation, when you're at the point where you usually go left, it's now he who is with you that will call you and lead you to the right. Not only that, it says the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua saying in verse seven, thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then shall thou also judge my house. And thou shalt also keep my courts and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. This is the walk. It starts where? Standing in Christ, believing in Jesus. But when we stand in Christ, guess what? From that moment on, we will start walking in Christ. And now he's commanded to walk. Just like Jesus, many years later, would come down and as he walked this earth, he would see that man by the pool and say there in the book of John, rise, take up your bed and walk. He didn't just say rise. He didn't just resurrect him. He raised him up for the purpose of walking. You have been forgiven, not just for the purpose of being set free, but you have been set free for the purpose now of living that freedom, practicing what Jesus preached experiencing what Jesus offered. We're trying to find every Bible power promise so that you can know that you are free. Therefore, you can live free. Because we walk, he then says, here now. Finally, as we conclude, here now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your fellows that sat before thee. <laughs> For they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, the great seed, the one Jesus. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the green engraving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I'll remove the iniquity of that land in one day. How is that possible? The stone, the seven eyed stone speaking to the idea that he sees perfectly because he is perfect. Jesus sees perfectly what you're going through, even your imperfections, but he's promised, I will forgive it perfectly as much as I will give victory over it completely. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye carry or rather call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. 
brothers and sisters, because of what the branch offers, you and I can accept. Because of what Jesus achieved on the cross, you can I, you and I can experience a wholeness in our sanctification that is not wishy-washy. I remember growing up and hearing my mom talking about the idea of people being sometimey. In other words, you know, there's sometime this way, then other times there's sometime that. The Lord wants to set us free from the sometimeiness that comes when we are not wholly his. And the path to wholeness starts with the word of faith. One word. And that word is yes. That word and that that power is to say yes. It's amazing when you start saying yes to Jesus, what he can do. It's amazing what happens in a person's life and how quickly, but not so much quickly, because I don't like to focus on speed because we like to focus on speed, comparing ourselves to other, how long it took to do this, that, and the other. But I want us to focus on the depth because he said there in Zechariah, I will take away his iniquity in one day. And I will do it how? Completely. If you're watching this today and you believe that God is offering holy holiness, whole holiness, I want you to pray with me. Father, praying now that we recognize what you are willing to do, what you have consistently said I will do for Israel, but Israel's got to believe it. Not do it, believe it. And if we believe it, you will do it. We will see it. We will, ex we, we will exhibit it. We will show it. And our spouses will see it. Our children will see it. Our neighbors will see it. Even our enemies will see it. And so I'm praying for that right now, for everyone who's watching all of us as we participate in this study right now, that we will just say yes. And we'll get now in this new habit of saying yes. And in doing this, by saying yes, you will sanctify us wholly. Because faithful, as faithfully as you have called us to it, you are faithful and you will do it. This is my prayer for Israel. This is our prayer for us today. And I look forward to us going from, from some timing to sanctified. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.